It is now time for question period. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, yesterday's AG report makes it clear that your dogged refusal to hear ministry staff warnings about the severe impacts of your cost-cutting winter road maintenance contracts led to serious injury and even death. The auditor is calling you out on your careless decisions to save a few bucks on the backs of Ontario motorists. You toyed with the lives of Ontarians. You weighed the potential for $36 million in savings versus the potential for injuries and fatalities, and you ran straight for the cash. Now the auditor tells us your inaction has led to hundreds of lawsuits, and this report will likely mean many more on the way. Deputy Premier, given the injuries and fatalities, as well as now the hundreds of lawsuits, could you tell us if the $36 million in savings was actually worth it? Was it all worth it? I, uh, I am going to immediately jump on anyone that when I'm standing and getting quiet, they start talking, they will get it. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking uh, the member opposite for that question today, of course, a very important issue. Uh, as I said yesterday in response to the auditor's report, uh, we do thank her uh, for the work and for the work of her team with respect to this thorough and thoughtful review. And as was noted in her report, Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation accepts all eight of the recommendations that the auditor has brought forward, Speaker. I'm sure I'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but I should also point out, Speaker, uh, that in 2013, before the auditor was asked by the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, member from Nepean and Carlton, come to order. Before the Public Accounts Committee made the request to have the AG come in, Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation conducted a comprehensive review of the winter maintenance program. As a result member of the work that the Ministry undertook, Speaker, since 2013, we have added 55 pieces of equipment in Northern Ontario, 50 pieces of equipment in Southern Ontario, Speaker. 20 area coordinators, Answer. a new director of maintenance, five area engineers, Speaker, to build in the oversight that we know is required in this program, Speaker. Thank you very much. Supplementary. The minister, the warning lights were everywhere, and your government turned a blind eye. Your own ministry officials were sounding alarm bells, and you covered your ears. Opposition members were calling on government to throw in to this into reverse, but you stepped on the gas, ensuring faulty contracts you introduced in 2009 would give you the savings you needed and to the heck with the consequences. Meantime, our highways were littered with pileups, closures and fatalities, calling out for attention and immediate action. In the last year alone, Minister, we've seen every major highway, the QEW, the 401, the 400, and countless in the north, hit with pileups, gridlock, and sadly, fatalities. Minister, what do you say to those motorists, to those injured, to those families who lost loved ones? At the very least, you owe them an apology. Better. Just apologize. Thank you. Just apologize. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member again, uh, the member opposite again, for his follow-up question. Speaker, as I said yesterday, I am uh, uh, quite determined to accept full responsibility for making sure that, following up on the auditor's report, that we do take the action required to make sure that Ontario drivers, for next winter and for all winters beyond, have the confidence in the system as they certainly should, Speaker. But as I said yesterday, Speaker, in addition to accepting all eight recommendations and in addition to the concrete action that we took following our own comprehensive review in 2013, Speaker, by next winter season, the Ministry of Transportation will have 28 additional roadside cameras to monitor road conditions, a pilot, pilot project in place for the public to track the location of the plows, more roadside weather stations to update changing weather, Answer. a revamped 511 website that's easier to read and have time-stamped information moving forward with respect to real-time display. Thank you. Speaker, in it Thank you. Final supplementary. Yes, sir. Invest in the roads, not the bureaucracies. Yes. Exactly. More bureaucracy. Minister, your refusal to apologize shows a breathtaking, shameful lack of empathy, especially given legislation on the books allowing for proper acknowledgement and apology in exactly these types of situations. Yet yesterday, as the Toronto Star reported, you as Transportation Minister refused to apologize. Minister, where I come from, if you do the wrong thing and you've hurt someone, you say you're sorry. 
The AG report right here makes it clear that your government mishandled winter road maintenance. People were hurt. Do the right thing today, Minister, and apologize to Ontario. Here, here, apologize. Thank you, Minister. Here, of course, what the member opposite, not surprisingly, Speaker, would refuse to acknowledge in this House is that that same Auditor General's report acknowledges that over the last Second 13 time. years, Ontario has ranked first or second in North America for highway safety. Speaker. That same auditor's report, Speaker, would also acknowledge that from 2003 until 2012, the number of deaths on Ontario highways relating to winter conditions has reduced. Mr. Speaker, that same auditor's report acknowledges and praises the Ministry of Transportation for the concrete action that we took following our own. The member from the PN Carlton will come to order. Second time. Carry on. As I was saying, Speaker, that same auditor's report acknowledges and praises the Ministry of Transportation for the concrete action that we've taken since our internal review. Do I accept responsibility for getting this right? I certainly do, Speaker. I'll keep working Thank hard you. to make sure we deliver an outcome the people deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You it, please. You it, please. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the Leader of Her Majesty, Salal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for uh, the uh, Deputy Premier. Uh, amidst all the noise you manufactured about last week's budget, you tried to quietly slip past the public some very important changes. But yesterday, yesterday the Auditor General called you out. She said that your proposed changes to the Government Advertising Act would allow you to put out a bunch of self-congratulatory ads, all at taxpayers' expense. To make matters worse, when asked why you were making the changes, you pointed the finger at the Auditor General, even though her office has rejected less than 1 per cent of your proposed ads. Deputy Premier, Minister of Finance, why are you come once to order. again attacking the integrity of the Auditor General to cover up your own partisan political moves? That's what they do. Well, Speaker, I am I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to discuss this. We introduced in 2004 legislation, the Government Advertising Act, that would ban the partisan ads that we saw over and over Member and from over Leeds again, starring none other Mr. than Agriculture. Mike Harris. Those ads were a complete misuse of taxpayers' money. They were partisan ads. We wanted to ensure that would if, um, if there's any doubt that I'm going to attempt to try to get some decorum, don't doubt. Minister of Agriculture, second time. M member from Nipissing. And the member from Stormont, Dundas, and Salkine Gary, in case you didn't think I heard. Please finish. We wanted to ensure that taxpayer dollars would never be wasted on that kind of partisan ad again. And that's exactly what we, that principle will be maintained in the, in the amendments to this legislation that clarify. You'll have a, a wrap up sentence. The member from Simcoe North and the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Carry on. Legislation expands her oversight of, of our advertising and it clarifies what is in fact considered partisan. Thank you. Supplementary. That answer is uh, insulting to the Auditor General and yes. it's insulting to Ontarians. Yes. Your proposed changes would threaten the credibility and reputation of the Auditor General. And yesterday, Ms. Lissick basically said her office is not going to play the part of Patsy for you. She called your proposed changes, quote, free campaign advertising. You can't get much clearer than that. Deputy Premier, will you heed the Auditor General's warning and withdraw the proposed Member from Trinity Spadine. Advertising Act? Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Deputy Premier. Speaker, our goal with the original legislation was put an end to those Mike Harris style ads. Yeah, Speaker, now we find ourselves coloring red bricks brown. 
We maintain our commitment to restrict um, advertising, Speaker. This strengthens and expands the oversight. And I have to say, I am quite surprised that a member of the Conservative Party is talking about government advertising. And I look forward to the third uh, question to discuss some of the uh, work that's underway by their federal cousins. Back to Deputy Premier, Speaker, we know this government is desperate to control a damage to its reputation. For the first time, we see Sir a Finance, Premier second time. being interviewed by the OPP yes, in a criminal go? investigation. So it's no wonder, Mr. Speaker, that this government is looking for any means to repair that damage, particularly when they can get someone else to pay for it. That someone else being the Ontario taxpayer. Deputy Premier, your proposed changes to the Government Advertising Act is fooling no one especially the Auditor General. Why are you asking taxpayers to pay for your partisan campaign-style ads? Smarten up, be honest with the people, do the right thing, and withdraw these amendments in your budget. I, I think people will be interested to know that the entire PC caucus voted against the original Government Advertising Act. Speaker. I think that uh, people will all be also be interested to know that we are looking at third-party advertising, which is a request that the Progressive Conservative Party has made. We are looking at third-party advertising, but let's look and see what the federal Conservatives are doing. They spent Member from Leeds, Grenville is warned. Minister of Government Services and Consumer Services, come to order. Please finish. Speaker, methinks I have touched a nerve. Uh, government spent 52 million taxpayer dollars Answer. advertising the Economic Action Plan in 2009 and 10 alone. Another 21 million in the Thank last you. 12. 14.8. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My lead, my uh, question is for the. Um, Deputy Premier, the Premier's sell-off of Hydro One will pay for less than 3 per cent of her transit infrastructure promises. You don't need to sell Hydro One to build transit or infrastructure in this province. The only people, the only people who are going to benefit from the sale of this Hydro Asset is a small group of bankers and consultants, and it will leave families and businesses with higher hydro bills. The plan is bad for Ontarians, plain and simple. Will the Liberals stop their wrong-headed sale of Hydro One? Before I go, the member from Beaches East York will come to order. The member, the Minister of Economic Development, uh, Employment, and Inter Infrastructure, come to order. And if I hear another one, he'll get warned immediately. Carry on. Well, uh, Speaker, I think only the NDP could pretend that billions of dollars was something to sniff at. Speaker, this uh, sale—we're estimating the sale will be about. Nine billion dollars. That is an enormous amount of money in assets owned by the people of Ontario that will be converted into assets owned by the people of Ontario. Speaker, the NDP pretends that they want to build infrastructure. Every time we have moved forward on, a, on a, an ability to build that infrastructure, they have stood in the way. Speaker, we are moving forward with our plans to build the much-needed infrastructure, and we will bring our resources to the table to make sure that happens, and it happens soon. Thank you. Speaker, since Monday, almost 15,000 people from across Ontario have sent the Premier a message that they don't want to pay for another one of her wrong decisions. Families don't want to see their hydro bills going up. Families don't want to lose control of the future of our energy Minister system in this province. Second time. Will the Liberals listen to Ontarians and pull the plug on privatizing Hydro One? 
Speaker, the, the third party is very, very good at saying what they don't want us to do. We are welcome, we would welcome their advice on how to accelerate investments in infrastructure. So let's look at what we're doing, Speaker, when it comes to uh, building much needed infrastructure. Carry on, please. Speaker, we're talking about the largest infrastructure investment in the history of this province, $130 billion to build roads, bridges, transit, other badly needed infrastructure across the province. That's over 100,000 jobs each year Order. that we are creating with this, with this investment. The third party Answer. has no plan. If they develop a plan, we'd sure like to hear it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier is ignoring the people of Ontario. They do not want her to sell their Hydro One. It is bad for families, and it is bad for business and our economy. The only people it's good for, Speaker, are consultants, bankers, and Liberal insiders. Why are the Liberals more interested in Trinity helping out Spadina, a handful of their time. friends than they are listening to the people of Ontario? Well, Speaker, that's kind of a stunning assertion because the people of this province will benefit from the infrastructure we will be able to build as a result of this decision. I think uh, people who are looking forward to 15-minute service from Union Station to Bramalee would actually say they benefit from this. I think people benefiting from the Northern Highways projects will benefit from this. I think people in, in communities across this province will benefit from the collecting, Connecting Links program. Speaker. I think people in London will, are delighted that we are moving forward on the environmental assessment for high-speed rail. This is about benefiting Answer. the people of Ontario, and it's about bringing our assets to their highest use, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Your question. The My second party. question is back to the Deputy Premier, Speaker. Selling Hydro One is going to mean higher bills. I haven't right. talked to a single Ontarian who wants higher bills, Speaker. It's going to mean giving— Minister of Children and Youth Services will come to order, as will everyone. Please finish. It's going to mean giving away control of a strategic asset that supports jobs, innovation and growth. Selling Hydro One might be the right decision for bankers and consultants and Liberal insiders, but it is the wrong decision for the people of Ontario. Whose corner are the Liberals in? Seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, as I as I have said, the people of this province are going to benefit enormously from the investments in infrastructure made possible by this and, and other decisions. Speaker, uh, I think former NDP cabinet minister Francis Lankin understands why this is a benefit to Ontarians. This is not about ideology, Speaker. This is about making those new investments that are critically important to the prosperity of this province, Speaker. And and uh, maybe. John McKinnon, the president of the Powers Workers Union, could convince the leader of the third party that this is good news. He says the Power Workers Union welcomes and supports the decision by government to keep Hydro One whole in an IPO process that would, in partnership with government, broaden the ownership structure in Hydro One. This will position the company to grow and provide further high-skill, quality jobs in Ontario. Thank you. Speaker, the Premier's plan was sneaky. She kept Ontarians in the dark. People don't like the Premier's plan to sell Hydro One. Almost 15,000 people have sent that mes message to the Liberals in less than four days. Speaker, The City of Toronto will be debating a motion that says stop the sale of Hydro One. And that motion was actually seconded by Shelley Carroll, who endorsed the Premier during the Liberal leadership. Are the Liberals ready to listen to the people of Ontario and pull the plug on this plan? Well, uh, 
Well, Speaker, the, the member of the third party might call this sneaky, but what that really tells us is that she hasn't been reading the budget. She hasn't been reading the economic there statements because we have been very, very clear, and open, and transparent in the 2014 uh, the Liberal platform, the 2014 budget, uh, which outlined the fiscal plan that the NDP ran on. The Speaker mentioned very clearly, and I'll happily pass over the 2014 budget for the leader to remind herself. Member from that. Essex, come to in order. In October, the Advisory Council released their interim report. The report was made public before the budget. We've been debating this issue in the House for months, and that will continue, Speaker, and the legislation will be subject to public hearings and debate. The Council has, has uh, uh, consulted Answer. widely on this. We believe the right decision for the people of Ontario is to move forward. The NDP is stuck in their ideology. Thank you. There you go. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier doesn't seem at all interested in hearing from anyone other than her hand-picked insiders. She doesn't want to hear what the auditor has to say about wasted billions and about Aurora, partisan advertising. Order. She doesn't want any public uh, ombudsman oversight auditor oversight, freedom of information oversight, or integrity commissioner oversight at Hydro One. And she certainly doesn't want to hear uh, from the most important people of all, the people of Ontario, the voters of Ontario. Speaker, her plan is arrogant, and it leaves people paying the price for another bad Liberal decision. Will the Liberals do the right thing? Stop listening to their hand-picked insiders and listen to the hard truth that selling Hydro One Question. is the wrong thing for the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, so, uh, Speaker, I think we're hearing loud and clear that this is about ideology, that they just believe it's the wrong thing without being able to back that up with any kind of evidence. Their assertion that rates will rise is completely false. They have nothing that will back that up. In fact, the experts are saying that this will put downward pressure on electricity rates, Speaker. There is a huge potential in Hydro One, and, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing what will happen to Hydro One as it gets more efficient. Speaker, something that we haven't talked about much in this debate is we're facilitating local distribution companies to actually consolidate, again, improving their efficiency and reducing, putting downward pressure on those rates. When it comes to oversight, the member opposite, although she, she is very Answer. clear about not trusting the private sector at all, Speaker, which is kind of astonishing Thank in you. itself, there Oh, yes, you will. New question, the member from McKee and Carleton. Mr. Ron, going back to Deputy Premier. Last summer, the government quietly released a report uh, from pension expert Jim Leach about hydro pensions. In it, it was quite scathing, actually. The government report stated that hydro workers in Ontario were getting $5 of taxpayer money for every $1 that they put in. Now you're claiming, and your government is claiming, a net zero solution by giving workers shares of Hydro One, which you're selling. And confusing it even more is you're giving OPG hydro workers uh, these as well for exchange and reducing their gold plate of pensions. If the values of the shares and the value of the pension changes are equal, as you suggest, then the province hasn't saved a single dollar. Minister, will you admit that the Question. pension mess you've created in Hydro is being put directly on the backs of ratepayers in the province of Ontario? Well, uh, Speaker, we are very pleased that a tentative agreement has been reached with the Power Workers Union. It is a net zero deal, Speaker, but it is out for ratification. So I'm not going to comment on a deal that actually is uh, before the members of that uh, union the so they can Renfrew. make their decision about ratification. So I'm going to respect that process. But I am very, very pleased that the leadership of, of uh, the Power Workers Union has expressed support, and I'm actually very excited that workers who work in Hydro One are going to are are demonstrating that they. Uh, may be interested in being owners of that, partial owners. I really believe that Answer. workers own part of the company they're working for. That makes for a stronger company. Thank you. 
Deputy Premier, that concerns me very much, the response that you just gave me, for two reasons. First is you're plugging one leak by starting another. Yesterday we talked about your mandate letter and your failure to meet it. Today you're just suggesting again that you're not prepared whatsoever to have any efficiencies in government or reduce uh, the bottom line in this province. Your net zero really means if this is going to go on the backs of the ratepayers. And this, the second thing, really concerns me. The Premier has consistently said the selling of hydro is going to invest in infrastructure, but now we know what's really on the books. Your plan to sell Hydro One is to pay off pensions, and that concerns every single ratepayer in Ontario who is going to have to foot the bill Question. for this so-called solution. You can't even execute a fire sale property. Will you admit to the ratepayers of this province that you are actually selling Hydro One in order to pay these pensions? You see it, please. You see it, please. Okay. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glenglary, as I threatened and warned, is warned. Deputy Premier. Speaker, I, I, as I said earlier, I really um, do want to respect the process. This is a tentative deal that has been reached. It is in the hands of members for ratification. I can assure the member opposite that it is a net zero deal. I am delighted about that. It is, Speaker, a deal that moves us in the right direction when it comes to addressing the pension issues raised in the Leach report. Speaker, we were the ones who commissioned the Leach report, and we are the ones who are We're acting, acting on it. Thank you for your question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, yesterday, my question to the Deputy Premier. Ontario's Independent Auditor General said the Liberal government is trying to gut the rules that stop public dollars from being spent on Harper style partisan advertising. And I quote, uh, these proposed changes would allow the government to spend public dollars on partisan advertising with little of the current independent Deputy oversight. Leader, the government time. could flood the province with self-congratulatory and self-promotional advertising that would be of little practical use to the citizens who are paying for it. Why are the Liberals taking a page out of Stephen Harper's playbook so that they can spend public money on these partisan advertisements instead of spending money on schools, on health care, or even on transit infrastructure? Well, Speaker, I mean, what we are doing is we are expanding oversight of the Auditor General at her request to include kinds of advertising that are not currently covered in the legislation. As I say, that was at her request, so we are moving forward on that. We are also looking at how the Act is being implemented, and we have what we have seen, Speaker, is that. Uh, legislation that was intended to prevent any government ever again running the kind of wasteful ads that Mike Harris ran, Speaker. What we are doing is we're clarifying what we mean by partisan. We may remain absolutely committed to ensuring that taxpayer dollars are not spent on partisan ads. This amended legislation will do exactly that. And I would like Answer. to comment, Speaker, that Ontario is the only jurisdiction in the country Member that has from any North, second time. restricting that kind of activity. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just want to say, I mean, we trust the Auditor General more than we trust what's coming out of the yeah, Deputy yeah. Premier's mouth. Remember that the Deputy Premier sang a different tune when she was speaking to legislation that restricted partisan ads in the past. In 2004, in this legislature, she spoke about some constituents who told her, and I quote, please remember that when you spend money, you are spending our money. Those constituents inspired then the Deputy Premier to add, it's just outrageous to me that governments spend money on what are, in essence, political pieces. Meanwhile, in Ottawa, Justin Trudeau, the leader of the third party, says he's got a problem with public dollars being spent on partisan ads, but in Ontario, the Liberals are gutting the rules so she can use public dollars to run their own partisan ads. Can the Deputy Premier explain why the Liberals think Ontario families Question. should pay for Stephen Harper-style partisan advertising that promotes the interests of the Liberal Party of Ontario? 
Well, Speaker, we are very, very clear. In fact, we are world leaders when it comes to restricting government partisan government outrage. The members opposite may laugh at that, Speaker, but there is no other jurisdiction in this country. In fact, I think you'd have to go to Australia to find the closest jurisdiction that has anything like this kind of legislation, Speaker. So let's be clear about what the, we're doing. We're expanding oversight to include other forms of advertising. We're providing a clear definition of partisan advertising. We're requiring the government to submit a preliminary review of the ad to the uh, Auditor General, and we're reinforcing rules around government advertising during elections. We are also moving to strengthen uh, third-party advertising regulation, Speaker, because we heard from the Chief Electoral Officer, and we Answer. believe that we need to do something on this front. Speaker, uh, this is, uh, we, we are making changes that will strengthen the legislation. Thank you. New question? The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Child care provides a strong foundation for our youngest learners, and we are committed to modernizing child care in Ontario, giving children the best possible start in life and ensuring families uh, have access to safe and modern child care is a top priority for our government. I know that for the constituents of my riding of Barrie, access to safe and modern child care is a very important issue. As a former teacher, I know how important it is for families to know that their children are cared for and safe when they are left in the care of others. Minister, can you please tell us how we are ensuring we are giving children the best possible start in life? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie for her advocacy for children. Since 2003, licensed child care spaces have increased by 70% to 317,868 spaces, providing more than 130,000 additional children with safe and reliable care. Since 2004, child care funding has increased from $532 million to over $1 billion. That's a 90% increase. And just yesterday, our government announced that we are creating approximately 4,000 new childcare spaces for Ontario families. We announced that over the next three years, $120 million in new funding will be dedicated Answer. to building safe, high-quality, licensed childcare spaces in schools all across Ontario. Thank you. Another milestone. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker and Minister. We know that our government recognizes the importance of investing in our children's future. We recognize the role that schools can play as a location for these programs that benefit children, families, and the community. Increasing childcare spaces in local schools is an, an important component of our government's commitment to community health. Our government wants to improve coordinated planning among the school boards, the municipalities, and the community organizations. Minister, I know the constituents in Barrie will be pleased to hear about the investment of $120 million in new funding wow. to create new child care spaces for Ontario families. Can you please tell this House how my community will be eligible to access funding Question. to meet the demand for affordable child care in our community? Thank you. Minister. Yes, thank you. Our government is proud to invest in families by supporting a modernized child care and early years system with more capacity to care for our youngest learners. Adding approximately 4,000 child care spaces for preschoolers in local schools is an important step toward building Ontario up. School boards and Consolidated Municipal Service Managers, or CMSMs, in Southern Ontario, District Social Service Administration Boards, or DSABs, in uh, Northern Ontario, will work together to identify eligible schools that meet the criteria, and what we're particularly looking for is underserviced areas, to support local need and apply through future rounds of the, of the Ministry of Education's capital Answer. priorities and school consolidation capital. I believe that in Barrie, the consolidated municipal service manager is the county Thank you. of Simcoe. So the Simcoe board. The new question, the member from Chatham Kent Essex. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the acting premier. I believe that honesty 
is the best policy. It is. So why? And the people of Ontario why? deserve honesty from their elected officials. There you do. That's why so many uh, were, were so many were shocked to learn of your government's plan to sell off Hydro One as a quick fix uh. for your spending addiction, without any mention of this radical plan during the election. Yeah. Right, it came out of nowhere. On peak hydro rates have gone up by over 49% since October oh, no. of 2011. Wow. wow. This decision will drive hydro costs even higher. Will do. People deserve to know what's coming so they can get ready as best they can. Yep. Especially so in rural Ontario. My question, Ontario. Acting Premier, is simply this: Just how high will hydro rates soar to pay for your broken Green Energy Act and countless other boondoggles? Oh, there there you Thank you, Premier. Well, Speaker, um, I too believe that honesty is the best policy, and that's why we were very honest in the 2014 budget, Speaker. Let me read from the 2014 budget. The government will look at maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Speaker, that was in 2014 budget. That was repeated in the second 2014 budget. It was repeated in the fall economic statement. It was repeated in the 2015 budget. There is nothing that has been hidden from the people. It was also in our platform. I look forward to the Answer. supplementary to talk well about done. that. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the, believe uh, the people of Chatham, Ken Essex, and those throughout the province cannot plan their budgets based on platitudes. My constituents have been inundated with over 600 industrial wind turbines, but have not seen any relief on their bills whatsoever. Just yesterday, an elderly, elderly constituent of mine showed me his Hydro One bills. He's paying far more in delivery fees than he is on Hydro. Yeah. The over 18,000-plus people in the rich town and other areas surrounding Chatham-Kent not being serviced by Integris deserve lower rates. They need a better hydro provider choice where they can have lower and more stable rates, especially for those low-income families and those on fixed incomes. Seniors have budgeted for their retirement, but they didn't budget for this government's <coughs> reckless hydro question. abandon. So, Acting Premier, my question is simple. Will you allow these residents to change their local distribution company provider before you sell off Hydro One so that they can afford their hydro Thank bills? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I, I'm glad to hear the member opposite talking about the burden of uh, energy rates on particularly low-income families. This is a challenge that uh, that we are, are, are member really Bruce concerned Green about South. as well, which is why we are introducing member for Renfrew, second time. To help those low-income families who are struggling with their uh, with their hydro bills. So, Speaker, I'm glad to know that the member opposite, and I assume his party, will support our initiatives to reduce uh, energy bills for those with lowest incomes. Thank you. Your question is from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier. Yesterday, as the government planned its Hydro One fire sale, the Auto General released a report which showed that, once again, yet another Liberal privatization experience has failed. The report shows that the Liberal privatization have made our winter roads unsafe. The NDP has raised this issue countless times, and the government keeps saying, trust us. We know what we're doing. Things will get better, but they never do. In light of these failures of this plan and the increased danger of Ontario roads in the winter, will your government admit Will your government admit that the privatization of the winter maintenance program has failed and apologize to the residents of Ontario for making our roads unsafe? Thank you. Thank you for your... uh, Minister Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member from, uh, from the uh, NDP for that question. As I said earlier today, uh, we certainly do take the auditor's findings very seriously as it relates to the winter maintenance program. Speaker, uh, one of the reasons that we launched the internal review back in 2013 at the Ministry of Transportation was because we understood uh, that there were questions being asked. As a result of that review, Speaker, I mentioned this earlier today, uh, after the 2013 winter, 105 pieces of equipment were deployed both in southern and northern Ontario. Those uh, pieces of equipment helped with truck climbing and passing lanes in the north. 
they help clear ramps and shoulders more quickly in the South Speaker. And not that many weeks ago, I had the privilege to attend, alongside many colleagues in this House, the Roma OGRA conference. And at that particular gathering, Speaker, I heard directly from municipal leaders representing communities like Red Rock, Red Lake, Terrace Bay, Ear Falls, and others who told me that following the action we took as a ministry, following our review, that they noticed an, a discernible improvement in winter maintenance in their Thanks, communities. Sir. It doesn't mean our work is done, Speaker. As I said earlier today, we accept all eight recommendations from the auditor. We'll keep working hard and we'll get it right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Minister, the, the contractor should have the equipment when you awarded them the contract. And, and taking responsibility isn't an apology. Mr. Speaker, the Premier was a transportation minister when many of these winter road maintenance contracts were signed. She agreed to let contractors decide for themselves whether they felt that plowing the roads after a snowstorm. And she thought it was a good idea to put contractors in charge of policing their own performance while keeping a performance penalty secret. Even today, her government refuses to release these contracts, the inspection records, and the penalties. Will this government stop protecting these private contractors and start protecting the public by releasing these documents today? Thank you. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. One of the things that I didn't have the chance to mention earlier is that just last week in Budget 2015, uh, measures were included that if passed, if that budget is passed, Speaker, uh, will permit the Ministry of Transportation to provide dedicated funding to increase, for example, the use of what's called de-icing liquids before the start of a storm in winters to come, Speaker. In addition, we'll be able to work with our contractors as a result of Budget 2015 to add dedicated spreaders for sand and salt in both northern communities, select northern communities, and also in congested urban areas, Speaker. The other thing that I said yesterday in response to the auditor, Speaker, is that because I have confidence that we will get this right, and because I also believe it's important for us to be held accountable, I have written to the auditor and I have asked her to come back in and pro provide a progress update following winter 15, 16, yes, Speaker. That's the accountability this government deserves to uh, put forward to the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. After learning that the Leamington District Memorial Hospital intended to close its obstetric services, many in the community began expressing their concerns through letters, media interviews, news reports and petitions. Concerns were expressed by Ontarians over the potential risk of having no birthing choice but travelling to Windsor. Having worked as a nurse, I understand the need for patients and mothers to be in emergency situations access to care close to home. It's much different in a large city where alternative services are more readily available. Hospitals in small towns like Leamington are important employers, playing a significant role in the local economy and helping to attract new residents and encouraging others to stay. Through you, Speaker, can the Minister tell this House what is our government doing to ensure that the voices of the community of Leamington are being heard. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Cambridge uh, for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, when I first heard about this issue in Leamington in October, I immediately reached out to the Erie St. Clair Lynn, the local health integration network, and to the hospital as well. Mr. Speaker, our government understands the unique role that hospitals in small towns and small communities uh, play across this province, uh, and that unique relationship was part of the reason why I asked the Lynn to press the pause button before any decision was made. It was important to me and to the Lynn that more time be taken to consult with members of the community and to hear their thoughts and concerns before any decision was made. Our government provided financial support to allow the hospital and Lynn time to consider all possible options. The Lynn created an expert panel involving municipal leaders, community members, Sir. and clinical experts to review the situation. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that we released the expert panel's report yesterday. Now that the report is complete, it's time thank for you. the community to provide their advice. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the great work being done to address this issue for the community of Leamington. I'm really pleased to hear that the expert panel considered the content of all consultations and considered the views expressed by many who wrote to the hospital about the planned closure of the obstetrics unit. I know how important hospitals are to communities, as my own constituents know how important it is to have quick access to the right care at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital. 
After many years of advocacy and work with our local LIN, residents of Cambridge and North Dumfries saw the start of an expansion project that will bring new and expanded services, including an updated obstetrics unit, to Cambridge. In fact, Speaker, the minister was with me to see the groundbreaking last fall. I hope the public continues to be engaged Question. and speak up for the community. Speaker, through you to the minister, how can the public continue to engage on the planned closure of the Leamington Obstetrics Unit? Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I am certainly proud of the process that's been undertaken so far. I, this is the community's turn, so I don't want to prejudge their reaction to the expert panel's report, but the expert panel does recommend a very innovative solution that will, in fact, allow live births, birthings to uh, continue to take place at the Leamington Hospital to support that community. The public can visit uh, the Erie St. Clair Lynn's website and provide direct feedback to the report already. There's also a public meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, May 5th, at the Roma Club in Leamington, where the expert panel will present their report to the public and to the Erie St. Clair Board, will be, they'll be there. And following that, the public will have a 30-day period to provide additional feedback uh, directly to the Lynn. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I want to applaud both the Lynn and the Leamington Hospital, and particularly the community, for coming forward Answer. with their advice, with some very innovative solutions as well and proposals. And I'm confident that by working together Thank and so closely together, we'll have. Thank you. New question, the member for Lynn, from Nipperson Cambridge. Thank you much. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, earlier this year, your government once again showed its disdain for rural Ontario by bringing in your cap-and-trade tax on everything, which is going to drive up the price of gasoline and motor fuels in my riding of Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, and all across rural Ontario. The price of fuel, according to you, is going to go up about three cents a litre. If the Liberal record is the way the Liberal record always has been, it'll probably be about eight. You had a golden opportunity in your budget to at least share the gas tax rebate with all municipalities like the federal government does. You chose not to, so as a result, I am bringing back my gas tax fairness bill this afternoon. And I ask you, Deputy Premier, on behalf of your caucus, will you show some respect for rural Ontario and stand up and support them by, by voting for my gas tax fairness bill? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the Deputy House Leader is warned. Deputy Premier. Mr. Finance. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. So the uh, members of the opposition are talking about taxes. It's astounding to me that they're now suggesting that we should increase taxes or dedicate taxes or even have any taxes, Mr. Speaker. The problem is we want to maintain a very dynamic and competitive business climate. The budget does not talk about taxes there. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. <laughs> Don't throw him under the bus. <laughs> What we already have is dedicated gas taxes to our municipalities to support infrastructure. We actually do, Mr. Speaker, support our municipalities and will continuing so. I will defer the supplementary to the Minister Member of Transport that can reinforce the excellent work that we're doing to support our municipalities, something, Mr. Speaker, that we've done as a result of the mistakes they made in downloading to municipalities. Thank you. Supplementary. The people of Mattawa. I was there to meet the Premier when she came up to visit Waden and Schroeder's farm to meet with farmers a couple of years ago. Neither one of us got there by the subway. There's only one way to get there, and that's by driving a vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So here's, you know, she likes to grouse about how the feds don't do their job, don't pull their weight. Well, the federal government will put $2.5 million of gas taxes into my riding this year. $2.5 million, and we only those with a public transportation system get anything from you. So I'll ask you one more time. Will you show respect for rural Ontario like Stephen Harper and the federal government does and support my private Order.
Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, to the very well respected Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you one thing that this government won't shift problems to the grandchildren of Barry's Bay, Ontario. Yeah. Right. And here's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Here's what we're doing. Here's You never know. Finish, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A couple of initiatives in our budget. Uh, we'll be investing uh, $15 billion in rural wow. infrastructure wow. for the province of Ontario. We also, we also made, Mr. Speaker. The member from Huron, Bruce. Mr. Over. Speaker, we also, we also instituted, on the advice of our rural municipal partners. A hundred million dollars for small community infrastructure, province of Ontario. Answer. Fifty billion dollars of that will be allocated by a formula, which was the suggestion of our rural leaders Thank right you. across the province of Ontario. Thank you. No, no. Your question, the member from the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. This government talks a lot about making Ontario competitive in global markets, but in their budget they've cut the Ontario Production Service Tax Credit, which supports the Ontario film and television industry. This budget will make BC more competitive than Ontario. Domestic and foreign producers in Ontario will suffer from the immediate implementation of these cuts, and they've warned they will take immediate impact on jobs. They employ tens of thousands of skilled, experienced actors and crews, not to mention all the resident, res, residual businesses, caterers, coffee shops, and local uh, shoots. Why does this government want to take us from Hollywood North to Hollywood Not? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to start by saying our government is proud of our record when it comes to the creative cluster here in the province of Ontario. In comparison to the rest of the country, we have the most generous tax credits for the creative clu cluster in uh, Canada. And in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, when you compare us to Quebec and BC, we are the most competitive jurisdiction. In fact, we compete with New York and Los Angeles. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with the change of the Canadian dollar, we're well positioned to uh, change our tax credit. Uh, the dollar being uh, low, it gives us a competitive uh, advantage. And uh, we have been building a sustainable tax credit here in the province of Ontario, and we continue to draw companies into Ontario to provide the type of uh, support we want for the economy by creating jobs. And we're quite proud of the, of the record we have as a government. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Canadian Media Production Association says that it is the stability and availability of film incentives, as well as Canada's talented crews, that attract the producers. But what the government has done in, is change the game for producers already filming here now. Yeah. It jeopardizes current and future production and makes us unreliable jurisdiction for them. A producer in Hollywood knows that incentives these are in Ireland, Hungary, New York, LA, Vancouver will go where it's competitive and predictable. Instead of X-Files and X-Men, the budget could leave us with X-Industry. Will this government work with these valuable stakeholders to rectify this situation? Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In our uh, 2015 uh, proposed budget, uh, we are continuing to support the creative industries through, and I want the member to, to listen to this. The Ontario Music Fund now receives permanent $15 million per year, uh, more than more than $439 million in the 2015-2016 for cultural media tax credits that's going out, and $6 million in 2015-16, and $10 million years starting 2016-17. Uh, 16, 17 to the interactive digital media tax credit. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to working with the creative cluster here in Canada, Ontario remains the number one competitive the jurisdiction and the most generous. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, that investment in transportation infrastructure is very, very important for the health and strength of our communities. Last week, I was thrilled to be joined by my 
colleagues from Mississauga and Brampton. And the Minister of Transportation made the fantastic announcement that our government would commit $1.6 billion for the Harinterio main LRT. This is a great news for the riding of Mississauga, Brampton South, and Peel region. However, having a federal partner when it comes to infrastructure funding is equally important. The federal government has released its 2015 budget. Mr. Speaker, my question through you to the minister is, question. is the federal infrastructure funding announced adequate for the province of Ontario? Thank you. Right. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I'm really happy the members asked this question because I think it's important to put the federal commitment to infrastructure into perspective. Over the next two years, all their increase in their infrastructure spend by is $750 million. That's across the entire country. Wow, that's it. This brings their infrastructure spending up to what sounds like a lot, $81 billion, but that's over 10 years. That's right across Canada. By comparison, here in Ontario, this government is investing a record $130 billion over the next 10 years in our roads, in our bridges, in transit, and in other important infrastructure. What that means, Mr. Speaker, is this Ontario government is investing three times more than the federal government in infrastructure in the province of Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, I would conclude by saying there's no question Answer. the federal government is abdicating their responsibility to help us build Ontario and Canada up through these investments. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Himself. for that answer. And I agree with you. While our government is making the historic investments in the GTHA, the federal government has been absent. Peel region is growing at an incredible rate, and we need a federal partner when it comes to funding our growing infrastructure needs. That is why this afternoon I will be debating a motion calling on the federal government to provide long-term, reliable, and stable infrastructure funding to build Ontario up. For too long, the federal government has abdicated its responsibility. For too long, they have been given tax credits to those who need it least, while the congestion in my community has gotten worse and worse. So my question, Mr. Speaker, given the federal government's lack of infrastructure funding, question. Minister, can you tell Ontarians what is our government doing to build Ontario up? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to commend the member for her motion that she's bringing forward today to make sure that the voice of Ontario is heard across this country and give all members of the legislature a, stand, a chance to stand up for Ontario and the efforts we're making to build Ontario up, because that's important, Mr. Speaker. We need to stand up for Ontario. And you know, something that really drives, I think, all of us a little bit crazy in this province is when people stand up, the politicians stand up and say they support infrastructure, they support transit, they support building roads and bridges across this province, but they say nothing about how they're going to fund it. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we're making the tough decisions to fund public transit because we need to build Ontario up. We're creating 110,000 jobs across this country, our province, by doing that. Yes, if only we had a strong federal partner, like the member suggesting, we could do even more. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, in February, my colleague from Great Bruce Owen Sound and I asked you to visit the Chesley Restorative Care Unit that was scheduled to close on May 1st. Since then, we've read hundreds of petitions into this house and we've sent you multiple letters about this valuable program. Yet two months later, you haven't come to visit the site to see the great work that is being done. You haven't. Locally, the South Bruce Gray Health Centre Board of Directors have chosen to dig into their reserves to extend this program to June 1st. So, Minister, will you commit today to keeping the Chesley Restorative Care Unit open and ensure this outstanding program is available to residents in rural Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Uh, and I know the, uh, the health centre at the Chesley site is extremely important to the community. And that's why, when that first question was posed, when I became aware, when my ministry informed me of the specifics uh, with regards to one unit, the restorative care unit at Chesley, that was a pilot project that began a number of years ago, uh, when we learned of the intention of the hospital, 
to close that union, unit. Rather, uh, I immediately engaged the LIN, the Local Health Integration Network, uh, to make sure that we provided the resources that we needed to do. In fact, they stepped in and created a review process. Ah. And despite the fact that the hospital actually uh, wanted to close this on May the 1st, we implored them to give the review through the, the LIN the, uh, the ample amount of time to actually yes, look sir. at the situation and review it properly. Uh, so the hospital has agreed, in fact, to extend with the support that we're providing through the LIN to extend that period of time to allow the review to continue. Yeah, look at Supplementary. You know, Please come and let the community show you the amazing work that they're doing, because quite frankly, your government's blatant disregard for frontline health care in rural Ontario has to come to an end. Hospitals are in disrepair, services are being cut, frontline health care workers are being fired, 68 RPNs in the riding of Nipissing alone. And what did you announce last week in the budget? Sadly, it wasn't more investment in frontline health care, Minister. It was another bureaucratic layer of 69 community health links. Seriously, Minister, we need help in rural Ontario. My colleague, Christine Elliott, order. the Whitby Oshawa MPP, Sir recently education, visited come to order. Harden Hospital. And she was appalled to see the condition your government has allowed the Concordon Hospital to deteriorate to over the last 10 years. Minister, will you commit Question. today to coming and visiting both Chesley and Concordant Hospitals and ensure that rural Ontario's frontline health care is the best it can be? Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm astounded that, uh, well, just like she invited me to visit Chesley, uh, I would invite her to visit any one of the 69 health links that already exist in the province, that if she was to visit those and understand Order. the important work they're doing. You don't understand yeah. health links. The member from Huron, Bruce, will come to order. You ask the question. Carry on. So she would understand the important work that Health Links are doing to support the 5% of the Ontario population. I find that a challenge to me, so you're warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, so I would, I would ask her to visit any one of the health links across this province. She may want to go to one near Leamington because she can visit the Leamington Hospital, as I was just talking about, and ask them about the process that I put underway Answer. with the local LIN, as I did with Chesley, to ensure that the right decision is, is made, and it's a decision that supports the local community, and it's a decision that is driven by strong community support. Thank you. I'd ask her to start by informing the community of the truth with regards to what happened. Thank you. New question. The member from Finnish, James Bay. My uh, question to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday in this House, I asked if the Premier would tell us when it is that she's being interviewed by the anti racket squad. We find out this morning that, in fact, she did so yesterday. So I, I'd like, and I think Ontarians would like to have an answer to the following question. First of all, has the anti racket squad also gone in and talked to Mr. Thibault? Have they gone and talked to Madam Sabera? And Mr. Lougheed, and if they have, can you give us an indication of what was said? Thank you. Deputy yes, Premier. Speaker, what I can say is that the, the Premier has stated publicly that the OPP and her council mutually agreed upon a date for a meeting to be conducted before the end of April. I can confirm that that meeting has taken place, Speaker. The Premier answered openly, and her answers were consistent with the public statements that she's already made. The Premier has been very open with this legislature, with the media, and with the public about the allegations related to the Sudbury by-election. Uh, we uh, are very pleased that uh, Glenn Thibault has joined our caucus, the member from Sudbury, Speaker, who is making a tremendous contribution already. And we will continue to cooperate fully um, with the police investigation, and we will not. We will let that investigation Answer. happen in the appropriate place. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 17, an act to protect child performers in the live entertainment industry and the recording entertainment industry. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members take their seats, please. All members take their seats, please. On April the 29th, Mr. Miller from Hamilton East Stony Creek moved third reading of Bill 17. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Miller of Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Creek. Mr. Sig. Mr. Sig. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Besson. Mr. Besson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Brown. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mrs. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Orozetti. Mr. Orozetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mrs. Verniel. Mrs. Verniel. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. <laughs> The ayes are 90, the nays are zero. The ayes being 90, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 20, an act to protect pupils with asthma. I'll call on the members. This will be a five minute bell. On April the 29th, Mr. Urich, sorry. On April the 29th, Mr. Urich moved third reading of Bill 20. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the court. Mr. Urich. 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 Mr.
Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bancroft. Mr. Bancroft. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Gates. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sanders. Sanders. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flint. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flint. Mr. Flint. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Ms. Verneal. Ms. Verneal. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Both please rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 90, the nays are zero. Hey! The ayes being 90 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 28, an act to proclaim the month of October as Hispanic Heritage Month. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Ms. Martins has moved third reading of Bill 28. All those in favor, rise one at a time, please recognize by the clerk. Ms. Martins. Mr. Martins. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Codrey. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Verneal. Mr. Verneal. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. 
Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Mr. Cloud. Mr. McCloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bancock. Mr. Bancock. Mr. Noble. Mr. Noble. Mr. Noble. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natashek. Mr. Natashek. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. Point of order. I, I would like to welcome a guest uh, this morning, Laura Blair. She's the sister of my legislative assistant visiting from Ottawa. Yeah. Thank you. The member from Windsor to come see on a point of order. The point of order, Speaker. Uh, famous Canadian actor Art Hindle came in late and missed the introduction or earlier. Welcome, Art. Welcome. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.